We're on problem 138. 138. In a certain business, production index P is directly proportional to efficiency index E. So P, so we could say that P is equal to some proportionality constant times E, because they say P is directly proportional to E, fair enough, which is in turn directly proportional to investment index I. So E is proportional to I. So we could say it's equal to some proportionality constant times I. And actually, we could go even a step further and say, well, if, e, if P is proportional to E, and E is proportional to I, then we could also say that P is proportional to I, directly proportional to I. So it might be some other constant some other constant times I. And you could show that. You could prove that mathematically, right? You take this and substitute it for E, and you get P is equal to K times E. E is equal to some constant times I. And so P is equal to Kn times I. But k and n were both arbitrary constants, so we could just call that m. So this is what this is the information that the problem gives us. P is proportional to k, e is proportional to i. I'm mean, sorry, p is proportional to e, e is proportional to i, so p is also proportional to i. So what are they asking us? What is p, p if i is equal to 70? So if we knew this proportional constant, we'd be all set. We could actually solve this problem, but maybe they're going to go through e or something. I don't know. So statement number one. Statement number one. E is equal to 0.5 when I is equal to 60. Well, we can definitely use this information to figure out what N is. And, but that by itself isn't going to help us. Because we can figure out what N is. And then once we know what N is, we can figure out what E is when I is 70. Because we'll put 70 here times whatever we figure out N is, and we'll get E. But without knowing what K is, that still won't help us. So statement one by itself, if I'm right, isn't right. That won't that won't help us. And I'll show it to you. Let me although this would be a waste of time if you understood that logic. Because you can say 0.5 is equal to n times 60. This is so we can solve for n. So n is equal to 0.5 over 60. That's the same thing as 1 over 120. And then you could say, so then that equation boils down to e is equal to i over 120, right? 1 over 120 times i. So when i is equal to 70, e would be equal to 70 over 120, which is equal to 7 over 12. But that still doesn't help us. e is equal to 7 over 12, but we don't know what k is, right? When i is equal to 70, e is 7 over 12, but we still don't know what k is based on just the information in statement 1. So as far as I can tell right now, 1 by itself, not so useful. Statement two. P is two. P is equal to two when I is equal to fifty. Well this is useful because we already said P is proportional to I. P is equal to some constant M times I. So we could use this information to solve for M. So P is equal to two when I is equal to fifty. Divide both sides by fifty, you get M is equal to one over twenty five. And so the question was, what is P when i is equal to 70. So we could just say p is equal to m times i. Well, i now is 70. And what's whatever 70 divided by 25 is, that's p. So statement 2 alone was sufficient to solve this problem. And statement 1 didn't help us much. Next problem, 139. 139, if x does not equal minus y, that's interesting, is x minus y over x plus y greater than 1. So why do they say x does not equal minus 1? Uh, sorry, x does not equal minus y. Well, if x were equal to minus y, if this were minus y, then you'd have minus y plus y, and the denominator would be 0, and you'd be undefined. So maybe that's why they, they put that out there. So let me try to, let's see, I think we could simplify this statement. So if we could multiply both sides by x plus y, you get x minus y is greater than x plus y. And so this holds true if what? Let's see, we could subtract x from both sides. Subtracting x from both sides, you get, we'll just get rid of the x's, you get minus y is greater than y. See, we could add y to both sides of this equation. So the left side, if you add y here, you get 0. Is greater than if you add a y on this side, you get 2y. 
And then you could divide both sides of this equation by 2, and you get 0 is greater than y, or y is less than 0. Either way. So this fairly hairy looking statement, Boyle, this statement is true if and only if this statement is true. So this is really all we have to test for, is y less than 0. If we know that y is less than 0, we know that this is true. Or if we know that this is false, then we know this is false. So statement 1. Statement 1 tells us x is greater than 0. Well, this is useless. This actually has no bearing on whether y is less than 0. x can be anything. It doesn't change this. So this by itself is useless. Statement 2 is, well, there, there you go. y is less than 0. So statement 2 tells us this is true, and this is true if and only if this is true. So therefore, statement 2 alone is sufficient to answer this question. Very seldom do you get do you boil down the statement to actually one of the statements that they provide you, but that, that, was, that was interesting. Next problem, 140. 140. In the rectangular coordinate system, are the points R, S, and U, V equidistant from the origin? OK, so they're essentially saying, is the distance of the point R, S equal, distance from the origin, equal to the distance, for, I'll call it D sub O, equal to the distance to the origin of point U, V? And here, just to get the intuition of distance, I always find it silly that they teach something called a distance formula in high schools. Be, because it's really just the Pythagorean theorem. And by calling it something different and making you memorize a different formula, it'll just clutter your head. So this is the x-axis, and this is the y-axis. The point rs will be here, where this is r, and this is s. This is the point r, s. What's its distance from the origin? Well, its distance from the origin is the length of this line right there. What's the length of that? Well, we can use Pythagorean theorem. The height right there is s. The base here is r. And if we call this distance, we use Pythagorean theorem. r squared plus s squared is equal to the distance squared. right? Or we could say that the distance, the distance is equal to the square root of r squared plus s squared, the distance to the origin. So this statement up here boils down to that the square root of r squared plus s squared needs to be equal to the square root of u squared plus v squared. Well, just to simplify things, let's just square both sides of this equation. And then we're, we're left with the question they ask is, is r squared plus s squared equal to u squared plus v squared? Is this true? That's what they ask us. And that kind of simplifies things, makes them more concrete. So let's see what the statements give us. Statement 1 r plus s is equal to 1. r plus s is equal to 1. Just off the cuff, I don't see where that's going to be actually useful. I, you know, It's not like you can just square this. r plus s squared is r squared plus 2rs plus s squared. So you can't just, you know, a lot of people make the mistake that thinking, oh, r plus s squared is r squared plus s squared. No, there's, that's not true. You have to distribute all the terms, and you end up with three terms. So that's not right. I don't see an r plus s anywhere up here. So let's, I don't know, let's, let's try statement number two. Statement number two. u is equal to 1 minus r, and v is equal to 1 minus s. So this, this, this seems like it could be interesting. Because there, it allows us to essentially reduce this question, which is a question of four variables, and turn it into a question of two variables by substituting u and v with these things. So let's do that. Let's let's turn this statement into a statement of two variables. I'll switch colors just to ease the monotony. So the left hand side is r squared plus s squared is equal to u squared. Well now they're telling us that u squared is one minus r squared plus v squared. Well v is one minus s. One minus s squared. Uh, let's just keep simplifying. R squared plus s squared is equal to one minus two r plus r squared plus 1 minus 2s plus s squared. See, we can get rid of, we can subtract r squared from both sides. We can subtract s squared from both sides. And we're left with 0 is equal to 1, 2, 2 minus 2r minus 2s. And let's see, we can 
bring the r and the s terms over the other side. So add 2r plus 2s to both sides. So you bring them over. You get 2r plus 2s is equal to 2. Divide the whole thing by 2, both sides. You get r plus s is equal to 1. Interesting. So when you put apply these two constraints on our original question, the question gets reduced to this. If we know that statement 2 is correct, the question that the problem was asking gets reduced to this. It's saying if we know that this happens, then the question is true if this is true. Well, just with statement 2 alone, we don't know that this is true. But as you see, statement 1 tells us that that is true. So if you use both statements together, you know that this question is correct. This question is true. And that was actually pretty interesting and a little bit hairier than normal. Normally you can identify immediately just by eyeballing it. But anyway. I'll